right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, tonight is a really remarkable uh, day in the history of the Eastern Europe and uh, CIS Club. We have uh, Mark Jadway from uh, Novatec here to speak, and uh, from my own experience as a relationship manager in Russia, and also from the general market knowledge, Novatec is one of the big players in the, Ru in the Russian and international oil and gas market and it's one of the top Russian corporates, so we are very proud to have representatives of this company here on campus today. Yep, and uh, on behalf of Energy Club, we also would like to welcome all of you here. We are very pleased to have you all here, and we have a very successful company in Russia, Novatek, and we have one of the most successful CFOs in Russia, uh, Mark. So we are very glad to see you, and this is kind of uh, one of the se speaker series uh, covering the CIS region also, and the, because it's heavily focused on energy. Um, and Alex will talk more about Mark, but we're very welcome. Yeah. Um, before we pass the floor to Mark, I wanted to uh, quickly introduce him. So uh, Mark is uh, CFO and chairman of the management board of uh, Novatac. He is also a member of the board of directors of Novatag and chairman of the board's strategy and investment committees. Prior to joining uh, Novatag in 2003, he was partner in the global energy mining and utilities practice at PwC in Moscow. And as I just learned, he came there to uh, sort of found the practice. Um, then uh, before that, he had various uh, financial and economic positions at a number of independent oil and gas companies. He is a certified public accountant and member of the American Institute of uh, CPA. He is also associate member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. Um, we also know that he has been recognized by International Relations Magazine as one of the best CFOs in Russia and CIS. And more recently, he was recognized by Institute of uh, Institutional Investor Magazine, sorry, as one of the top five CEOs in the European oil and gas. So without further ado, I'd like you to welcome Mark Jadway. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody, and it's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's usually when I'm speaking, it's, it's more in an environment where we're talking to investors or bankers. And today I spent uh, most of the day cheering the International Petroleum Week's gas day. So it's kind of an interesting day because usually I'm sitting speaking, not cheering. Um, Nova, Novatech, as you, as you mentioned before, is, is a very interesting, very interesting story. We're, we're one of the few companies in Russia that was not privatized when we look at the oil and gas space. It was a company that was basically founded by individuals. So we did all the exploration, we did the development, we built the infrastructure out, we did the marketing, production, and what we built is a company that had zero production in 1994 to now we're producing about 1.4 million barrels of oil equivalent today. We're considered the world's largest independent gas producer and we're the holders, we're ranked number four in the world in total companies in terms of holders of natural gas resources. Um, what I did for today for the presentation, I, I, and I'll talk a little bit about Novatech a little later, but I thought it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about what's happening in the global gas industry. Um, and I'll cover a couple areas, and, and not only just on the gas, but what's happened in the shield story in America, what's, how is it affecting pricing, uh, what we're seeing, some of the flows and changes and dynamics, because it's an industry that, that essentially has gone through a lot of changes. Um, it's constantly in the news, and what we hear today, even talking to governmental people, uh, particularly in the EU, is you know, the anti-gas sort of gas approach you know, they're, they're very pro-alternative fuels, and every time we want to mention something about natural gas, we seem to be, you know, the problem child in the industry today. Although, when you look at all the statistics, natural gas will play a, a, a large role for the foreseeable future in the energy mix. But this goes back, we went public in 2005, and we went to the market, you know, and we, and we started talking to investors about the story and what we're going to do. We had a completely different perspective of what the gas industry looked like in the world. I mean, most people, uh, and I think if not, if not everybody in the global oil and gas industry, 
focused on the United States as one of the big, large imported countries. So all the flows that you saw here on this particular slide showed that there would be natural gas flowing into to, to the U.S. market. So we've seen a lot of investments made in terms of regasification terminals. We saw a lot of projects that were earmarked uh, with the aim of, of, of targeting you know, the high U.S. market. You know, Russia at this particular time was still primarily focused on selling natural gas to Western Europe. And the Asian market, although we knew it would eventually be important, it wasn't really the primary market today. It was really, in 2005, it was the, the, the view of the United States. And, you know, how times change. Today, we look at it, you know, and we look at what's happened. Well, in America, as you probably all heard, if you're, if you're in the Energy Club, the, the, the shale revolution. You know, it was, it was a completely, uh, you know, a, a, an area of the business which is actually not new because uh, if you look at history, the first shale production in, in America was 1825. It was a small producer, produced gas uh, from, from shale and sold it on a local market in New York. It was really the first natural gas company in America. Um, but we've seen it like slip away, conventional gas, easy to extract, that's what most people explore it for. Um, and then in America, basically, we had a, a gentleman by the name of George Mitchell who uh, ran a company, Mitchell Energy, uh, out of Fort Worth, Texas. And, and he started doing these, what we call horizontal. So he started the process in, in roughly about 1981 of going out and what we started seeing these long horizontal wells being drilled into zones that were hard to extract or what we call uncon unconventional. But it, it probably lasted about 20 years where, where you saw activity going on, but there was really no major impact to the, the gas market. Well, that changed in about, about 2007, 2000, 2006, 2007 area, where you saw a, a, an exponential increase in the number of drilling activities that happened and in America, specifically re related to drilling for unconventional gas wells in primarily areas of uh, Texas, Louisiana, in the uh, Barnett Shale, which is outside of uh, uh, Fort Worth, uh, Haynesville, we saw, you know, now we have the, the big Marsalis fields in Pennsylvania, New York, and then we have the Bakken, which is in North Dakota. And, and so what happened is that we had a situation also where Wall Street played a key role um, and it seems that they're always involved in some of these problems, but there was access to cheap capital. So you had, you had a situation, and it's, and it's almost like if you're on a treadmill. So you, you, know, you run, 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 and you look around, you never go anywhere, and that's the same thing almost what we would say with a, uh, unconventional drilling. You have to drill a lot of wells because you have these really steep decline curves, and you have to replace them. So that was being fed by cheap sources and access to Wall Street capital, and also the, um, the higher prices that we saw in 2004, 2005, et cetera, where companies were funding a lot of the drilling programs and sustaining the drilling programs because they were looking at now 60 month or five year hedges looking forward on, 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 on the risk management side. And so they were able to sustain a cash flow to, to fund their operations. Well then in 2008, the crisis came we started seeing a collapse in the, in the, in the, in the, oil, in the oil price. We see a collapse in the gas price. We see a dry up in the access to capital. And all of a sudden, you see this huge change where projects are no longer economical. So we've seen that, that sort of shift away where now the potential was the United States moving out and exporting natural gas rather than being this big importer. This is what it looks like today as best as we can say. You know, it's still a very, very confused market. There's still a lot of discussions uh, on whether or not the United States will be an exporter of natural gas. The new market is obviously the Asian Pacific region. China, uh, you know, for all measures, it has an insatiable appetite for as much hydrocarbons as they can possibly get their hands on. And, and we see these flows, uh, although confusing, it looks, you know, pretty complicated. You know, there are a lot of interrelated flows that you see on this particular chart. 
Russia will still be a major, major supplier to the, to the European Union. Uh, Russia will also be a big supplier eventually in the form of either pipeline or, or LNG to the Asian Pacific market. When I go back into, again, uh, the Americas, um, we see there's an enormous amount of regulatory hurdles still to be uh, un undertaken and resolved. Now, we have one, pro one project that has been passed, which is a Sabine Pass project. That's been approved for export. Um, they're reconverting the regasification to an export facility, but there's probably about 30 or 40 projects that are on the drawing board that are waiting to go through a regulatory process. We do not believe, from an industry perspective, that the United States will be a major exporter of, of LNG, but nonetheless, that, that, that potential exists, which has now almost completely separated the, the global gas industry in terms of different pricing environments. The Asian Pacific market linked to primarily crude oil. Russia is still a regulated market, controlled, slowly liberalizing the market. We think probably by 2015 to 18 time period, we'll see a liberalized market. You have a um, European market that's basically priced on, on oil products, oil-related type pricing in the United States with the most transparent based on Henry Hub. And we're seeing that the Henry Hub is basically dis dislocated from the oil price. But this is the current flows as we stand today. New areas of the world that are emerging. Um, over the last couple of years, we've had some significant new, new developments, uh, exciting plays. I mean, I, I think they're still in the areas of the world where you, know, you have a high political risk or a high country risk operations. That's, that's the areas of East Africa, you know, Tanzania, Mozambique uh, type of uh, LNG gas discoveries. You have uh, you know, the East Mediterranean, so you have the, you know, the big finds in the, in the Cypriot, Turkish area, and you know, that problem is still you know, being resolved in terms of who owns what and who's willing to make any investments because of the uncertainty on the boundaries. And then I think the, the next big wave of, of activity in the gas industry, as well as the oil industry, is the eventual move into the Arctic Circle. And we'll start seeing uh, over, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about this a little bit more, but we're gonna start seeing a lot more activity as we start moving further north in the Arctic, because if we look at the reserves today, uh, the US Geological Service, which basically mapped out all the major basins around the world, essentially said that about 30% of the undiscovered gas reserves and about 13 to 20% of the undis undiscovered oil reserves reside in the, in the Arctic Circle. Within the Arctic Circle, approximately 90% of the gas and 75% of the oil resides in an area off the shelf of Russia, um, which, which adds to the sort of resource wealth of the country. And, and then in 2004, you may remember uh, uh, where the Russian submarine went to the subsurface in the, uh, in the, in the polar circle and laid the titanium flag down and Russia declared that it owned all the, of the Arctic Circle. Raised a lot of problems with the five countries that border it, um, but nonetheless, there's a lot of discussions and a lot of activity today in, in the Arctic world. Um, but just looking at some of the, the, the markets, um, Russia is a big, big producer, big consumer of, of, of natural gas. Uh, it's, it's, in terms of a market, it's probably second after the United States in terms of cons consumption. Fastest growing, as I mentioned before, is, is the Asian Pacific market. I think, I think China last year, uh, average growth was about 12, just under 12% in terms of consumption. And so I think eventually China will take over as the leading uh, consumer of, of hydrocarbons, including natural gas. One of the things that probably more uh, closer to home, and, I, and you're seeing a lot of this recently, there's been a lot of discussions and a lot of news flow just uh, over the last couple of days of, uh, on the UK press of what's going on here in the UK in terms of supplies, the cost of, of hydrocarbons here, here in the UK. But what we see in the, in the European uh, Union, the big problem we have is that we have a declining indigenous production. So it's inevitable that throughout this whole process, no matter what happens in this particular region, Europe will always be dependent on imports of natural gas. Um, 
Asia, as I mentioned, um, China being the, the, the leading uh, consumer. Uh, we don't know, and when we get into talk about China, because that's, you know, that's clearly the, the, the unknown factor as we speak today. I mean, I, I don't think you can talk to any, any, any industry player, any consultant, advisory firm who's looking at, at you know, the Asian market can give you a, a really definitive answer on what the potential consumption patterns of China will be. Now, if you look back at 2008, and, and, I, and I've you know, been fortunate enough to sit on uh, some of these gas panels where I had the same panelists uh, for three years in a row. And you know, a typical, we had the you know, International Energy Agency, uh, Wood McKenzie, um, you know, IHS Sierra. Uh, we usually had you know, one or two industry players uh, and maybe a smaller consultant firm. And we would go through this process and you would see that even in like 2008, for example, the gap between the low and the high was probably the widest it's ever been in terms of what they've been ever reporting that really nobody had any idea what the demand would be in any of these particular regions. And, and, um, and, and no fault to them because it, it's, it's difficult to predict. You know, we were in a, a completely uh, you know, uh, uncertain environment of the economic situation. We saw a collapse. We didn't know how the, the extent, how deep it was going to be. Um, but largely, it was also in relations to, to, to China, because nobody had any really sense of what the Chinese government was doing, because they were very closed. And, and, e and even today, when, you, when you, you, look at, you look at China as consumption, and, and how we measure this thing in terms of energy, you look at total energy source. And total energy source, or total energy primary source, includes gas, oil, coal, hydro, nuclear, you know, renewables, and so, and you look at China, and China is about 4% natural gas. So in all the models that we've seen, it was essentially the assumption was that China would go from 4 to 8%. And, you know, and based on that, that pattern, you would basically try to figure out what the, what the overall consumption in China would be. Um, I would argue, and I, and I argued uh, many times, because the industrial countries, whether you're looking at Europe, uh, uh, America, or you look at Russia, you know, it, it's about 25 percent, 20 to 25 percent range. So you always say to yourself, why is everybody only assuming China's going to go from 4 to 8 percent? What happens if it goes to 10 percent or, or 15 percent or gets anywhere near what these industrial countries or in terms of their consumption of natural gas, you know, and, and we would always get these sort of blank looks because nobody really looked at it because, again, the Chinese government was never forthcoming and they were basically trying to, you know, mask some of the problems with the coal sector, the environmental concerns, and, and, and playing their cards very close to their chest because they knew intuitively that they had huge amount of consumption of natural gas and they were in a lot of discussions with Gazprom from the Russian side on delivering gas directly to them via pipeline. And that's why I think today we can still not get a, a resolution to a contract because, you know, Gazprom refuses to sell it to them at a discount. China is still saying, I'm not going to pay world, oil, uh, world gas prices. And we have this sort of impasse, but eventually it, it will be resolved. Now, when we look at that particular area of the world also, Another, another, another question arises is nobody ever talks about India. You always hear China, you know, or you hear, you know, Fukushima, nuclear problems, Japan, but you, but you, but you never really look at, at India. And but just between China and India, you've got 66% of the world's population and, and, and growing, growing, growing middle class, growing consumption patterns. And, and when we talk about the intensity, and you know, when, again, you're doing your research, what you, what you look at is you have a, a standard of living that a lot of, a lot of people here have uh, become used to, accustomed to, at a certain level. And, and in order to get that same intensity of energy consumption as a percentage of GDP in both China and or India, and God forbid, both of them at the same time, we don't have enough hydrocarbons in the world to, to meet that kind of supply side. So we have a lot of projects that are on a drawing board and a lot of them, whether we look at the, um, you know, the, the Australian 
uh, LNG projects that are in the market, you know, what's going on in terms of Qatari, what they're going to do, um, you know, what's Russia's future role in terms of LNG, including our project uh, at the Yamal LNG, um, you know, will the United States eventually build these liquefactions? They're all really based on supplying the Asian Pacific market, and, and, and time will tell what the actual consumption would be. Now, in terms of sector, uh, you know, I, I think if we look at, if you look at gas today, uh, overall, overall, we're probably looking at from, for over the next decade, about two and a half percent compound annual growth rate in terms of consumption. Now, what we find is that the pattern of consumption on regions is, is quite different. And, and, and an argument that we, you know, we always talk about, and I think it's a, it's, you know, even in your own research or you're doing your own studies and you're, uh, of your own work, um, it, it's, it's very difficult to broad brush things. I mean, you really have to get down and peel through the onion and, and find out, you know, specifically markets of where you're delivering, where you're operating. Because if we were sitting around and, and you know, we looked at Russia, for an example, I get questions all the time from investors or analysts saying, well, demand is down in Russia or demand is flat or demand, you know, is not growing as it historically has been growing. And the answer is, you know, more or less correct. But within Russia, you know, each region that's consuming gas has its own growth factor. So if we look at an area that's uh, very industrial, either like Perm or Chelyabinsk or Hantimonsysk, which are big industrial sections of Russia, you know, maybe the consumption growth in that particular area might be low. It might be half of 1%, but it's a big region consuming natural gas. And then you flip to the other side and you say, well, well let's look at Northwest Russia with St. Petersburg in, in that growing area with the new auto industry being built, the new power stations, you know, and that's, that's tracking about 8% per annum, you know, growth. So you can't just all broad brush because as we look at in marketing, we're tending to move into some of these new areas. And we're seeing the requisite growth in our, in, our, in our downstream commercial operations. And it's the same thing when we look at, the, like, Europe. When the economic crisis occurred, people said, oh, Europe is contracting. Well, it was contracting in southern Europe. But Germany still seemed to be consuming natural gas. You know, and, and some of the other, you know, more buoyant countries that, you know, France was okay. You know, we didn't see the, we didn't see the complete collapse. And so it's just, it's just hard when, you, when, you're, when you're looking at some of these statistics, you really need to, to delve down into the numbers because I think sometimes it's really easy to make this broad brush assessment in reality when you look at the facts, it's, uh, it, they're specific on regions. But we see in this particular area within the primary energy source, gas is obviously the fastest growing. It's not the biggest and it's gonna take a little while before you know, natural gas overtakes crude oil as part of the uh, total primary energy source uh, on the consumption, but it's clearly the fastest growing and clearly the most uh, fossil fuel uh, uh, friendly of, of, the, uh, of the commodities. Now, an another thing that's kind of interesting that just happened recently uh, in the marketplace is with the shield revolution in the United States, we've seen a completely uh, dislocation of the U.S. coal industry. We're, we're seeing now for the first time that cheap coal is being exported to, to Europe. And Europe having the capability to switch on a product is taking this cheap coal while they have a chance and, you know, and then on the flip side is reducing the actual purchase of natural gas from, from Gazprom in Russia. And we're seeing this sort of uh, vicious, vicious cycle working because of the way the pricing model works. And I'll, when I get into pricing models, I'll give you some other numbers that kind of you'll understand how, how dysfunctional the, the, the pricing markets are because of uh, the calorific parity bases. But, but nonetheless, the coal has come in and, and it's becoming a, a very, very important competing fuel. Now, whether or not that's sustainable you know, remains to be seen because we got this problem on carbon issues. And if we just look at, again, the last couple days of all the arguments about you know, carbon credits, et cetera, being traded at $45, $50, and all of a sudden now they're down to three. Nobody concerns anymore about what the environment is 
and we, we're going to go back into this vicious cycle, whether or not you know Germany or or you know France and the nuclear energy and all these coal companies, you know whether there's going to be an issue or a policy issue driven by by the EU, and and when you get into that discussion, you know I'd have to say, and you know I, I'm I'm born and raised in, in the United States, but I'd have to say that the uh, EU looks very distinctly like the Politburo members during the Soviet era, you know and. Um, this is uh, a little bit about, I'll, I'll move a little bit now to some of the uh, unconventional versus conventional gas and some of the challenges. Um, this is just a summation of our views of, of certain you know, risk. Uh, but, it, but, but I just want to stress here, when we talk about, when we talk about unconventional, uh, you, you really, really hear an enormous amount of hype. You know? And, and I don't mean that in disrespect for the, for the, for the success that, that the U.S. market has achieved, because the U.S. market, what it's achieved is, is truly remarkable in the annals of the, in the history of the oil and gas industry. And the technology that has come out of that and, and, the, and the completion techniques that we're seeing today is just amazing and fascinating, and, and, and it gives you a lot of hope that there's a lot of additional uh, efficiencies to be gained by uh, technological advances in the oil field services industry. But, but, but when we look at it realistically, you know, there's been a lot of hope, and that's what I think it is, it's a lot of hope, because I go back to the EU, you know, the Energy, Energy Commission and the government and, the, and policymakers, you know, they want diversity of supply. And they're trying to figure out ways of, of reducing their dependence on importation of, of Russian gas. Now, some of the problems that you, we have when we, when we really understand what's the genesis of this problem. Well, the genesis of this problem is, you know, the, the Russian-Ukrainian issue. And the, the couple of periods of time where they had a spat and they shut off production. But what they failed to, to really disclose to people is that the Soviet Union even at the height of the Cold War, and if, if you even look at it today, is 40 years of, of more or less uninterrupted deliveries of natural gas into Western Europe. And for 19 days that this shutoff entailed over this whole particular period of time, you know, Russia's an unreliable supplier. And half of that time was really due to theft on the Ukrainian side as opposed to problems on the producer side being shut in. So I, you know, I think the press has picked up um, and, and with sort of an anti-Russian slant. Uh, and again, being a U.S. citizen, I can be a little more objective in this because I'm reading from both sides. It's, it's you know, pretty, pretty uh, bad when you're reading some of the stuff coming out of The Economist, Financial Times, et cetera, and, and their viewpoint on Russia. And even CNN, when I'll see, you know, demonstrations on the streets during a, during a recent Duma election, only to look at the thing and say, well, that, looks, that doesn't look like Cyrillic, that looks like Greek. And it's some, somewhere it's in, in Athens and they're calling it Moscow. Uh, so I, I, again, it's just gotta be, gotta be a little, little objective, my friends, you know. It's just, but, this, um, but this unconventional story that we see that's played it, itself out in, in, in Europe, um, you know, really started with the aim of trying to, like I said, relieve itself of the, uh, the imports of Russia. And, and there was a lot of hope, and the hope started in Hungary. You know, that was really the first wave of, uh, of, of exploration. But it, but it was clear, and then if, if you really follow closely, when you get a, a super major, see, a lot of times what happens in the industry, that the exploration activities are usually done by small independent companies. They're usually in there first, they go in, they do this work, and then they, 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 they find a, a play, they find a new basin, super majors come in later, and they basically take over, buy out, and actually start the process of developing and monetizing the resources. But it's usually the independents. No different, the United States uh, oil and gas, you know, you have the Exxon Mobil, Chevrons, ConocoPhillips, et cetera, but the true heart and soul of the United States uh, oil and gas industry has been and will continue to be the, the independents. They're the risk takers. And so it was funny when you saw Exxon being one of the early players, 
start farming out, starting to sell their acreage. And it was basically instructive that, you know, they weren't really finding anything. And so we went through this Hungarian story and basically most people have kind of moved away from Hungary and then Poland came in. And, and you know, history will tell you that Russia and Poland, you know, unfortunately, Ru po Poland happened to be squeezed in the middle between Germany and Russia, you know, hap happened to be the territory everybody fought over. Um, they, you know, they were really, really hopeful that they can relieve themselves up. And the industry got very, very excited about this. And, and we had this whole, you know, idea about, you know, what's going to happen in Poland, the success, you know, Europe will be liberated from Russia once and for all, um, you know, and we'll go back and we'll get some, you know, different diversified supplies. But, you know, at the end of the day, Poland is basically a failed, failed attempt. Um, now, now, you know, there's been stuff here in the UK, as you're probably well aware. I mean, talking to some gentleman today, he was like, he was trying to tell me that his company was not responsible for creating earthquakes in the UK, but, you know, but that's essentially what happened. They get, you know, there was a, an earthquake from their, from their fracking operations and they basically uh, uh, stopped activity. Uh, and then in, in the US, you have the same anti-fracking movements. France, forget it, you won't even get through anymore. Uh, Italy has a kind of a, 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 an opposition to fracking. Uh, Germany, et cetera. So what I tried to do here in, in this particular slide, looking at, so in, in, as we look at Europe, there's a lot of barriers to this process. You know, shale itself, although it's, it's around the world, if you took a map and you looked at the, the, the potential hydrocarbon potential around the world, there's an enormous amount of shale opportunities. The, the problem is each shale project is a standalone project. Each of the subsurface, the geology, is different. You know, the service industries are different. You can't just pick one up and replicate it, and that's what was the hope. Everybody hoped that they can pick up the model that was done in the United States, plop it over to Western Europe, and, and the problem was solved. And we're finding out some of the impediments, for example, was that there's about 70 drilling rigs in, in Western Europe. You know? And if you took, so you, you're starting to do the math now. You took all 70 drilling rigs, you, you put them in Poland, which is not, it's not a real assumption, but you say, well, let's take it to the extremes. And they're all drilling. And, 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 and you're, you're successful. Well, what you end up finding out, if you drill for 20 years, you would get 2.2.5 BCF of gas per day, which is about 4% of European consumption. Now, this is 20 years of drilling, right? And you forgot the fact that Europe is declining massively in the other side. So, you know, you're really not making any big gains. Now, the, the, the most recent area of, of interest in Europe is Ukraine. I mean, Shell has just signed an agreement. They're, they're you know, at the very, 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 very early stages of, the, of appraisals. But unfortunately, I, and I, I kind of feel that the Ukrainian citizenship is really optimistic about this because, because there is a, a, a very, you know, um, concerted effort by Russia to eventually bypass the Ukrainian pipeline structure, and, and whether it's from the North Stream or eventual South Stream uh, pipeline, um, you know, I, but Ukraine is, Ukraine's the next area, and I think everybody's getting excited, and I think at the end of the day, you're gonna have the same sort of disappointment that at best, at best, we're probably looking for some regional gas substitution, but it's not a pan-European solution. But some of the problems we see is, you know, water supply. You know, you know, you need a lot of water because fracking is basically water intense. You know, so if you have areas of the world that have water problems, like say for China, for example, China is now hoping with this big unconventional program, well, we know China has a tremendous water problem. You know, uh, the environmental issues of the fluids. Now, again, un unfortunately, I, I think it was Matt Damon had a movie recently on anti-fracking, which, you know, I don't know how much Hollywood spend for it, which they tend to go very liberal, but they spent a lot of money. I think the movie brought in about a million dollars. I mean, there's not a lot of interest in it, but, you know, but, he, but, he, but he did it. And, 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 and what you end up finding is a lot of it's water. The, there's only a small percentage of the actual fluids that are inside the drilling mud and stuff that's being fracked and the pumping in, that's actual chemicals. And so I, I think there's a lot of misinformation that needs to be debunked. 
you know, we don't know the resource, we don't know the total resources once you start producing. Like I mentioned before, geology is different. You know, the United States has been blessed with very uh, uh, shallow depths for, for their shale. It's not the same in Germany, it's not the same in Poland, it's not the same in, in, in China. Another area is the populations. Well, again, if I'm on a farm out in East Texas where, you know, uh, you know I have a million acres of open land, it's easy for me to drill all these successive wells. Well, you're sitting in somebody's population, you know, big, big, big industrial area, you, you don't have the ability, the flexibility to keep doing these wells. And I'll show you some slides where, you can, where you'll get an understanding what we're talking about, the intensity of drilling to, to maintain a, a, a shale program. The United States has mineral rights. Shareholders, landowners own mineral rights. A lot of these other countries, they're owned by the state. Um, so, and then I, I mentioned before the, uh, the difference in, in the oil services. You know, I, I just think there's a, an enormous <coughs> amount of differences in terms of uh, the service industry, the maturity of the service industry, uh, in order to be able to accomplish uh, anything close to what the United States has did. The other thing is, is that when we go back to the U.S. market, then these are some of the major basins that we see that have shale potential. Um, I, ha I have this slide in two ways. I mean, I, I did this slide in, in 2010, and this was just updated on recent information I, I received from Credit Suisse. Um, but what it really does, it shows, you know, what the average play, what's a break-even point, assuming a 10% return on investment, internal rate of return, or sometimes 10% after-tax profits. And you can see the average play to make it profitable at 10% returns is about $3.70 per MMBTU. Well, the NYMEX is $2.70. Right? So we've seen already, just like we saw in 2010, is about 85% of the shale plays that are being drilled are un uneconomical. They're losing money. They're value destruction. You know? and, and, and what happened uh, that facilitated the, the big rush, remember I said we had this exponential increase in, in drilling activity in 2006, 2005, 2006, because what they did, and they did it very smartly, a lot of companies hedged forward five years, six years, you know, five years of production, usually 60 months. And, and what they were able to do, they were able to sustain the cash flow from the hedge activity, as well as the availability of cheap financing on Wall Street. Well, what slowly happened as the, the Henry Hub price started going down, you know, Keeper were still drilling, they still had cash returns above the average play, Wall Street was still providing money, but now the licenses that everybody was bidding on and they were paying a lot of money for these bonuses, et cetera, to have these mineral licenses, you have to drill. And these licenses were forcing these companies to continuously drill, although everybody saw from the industry, we were getting to a point of the supply problem. And, and, and you know, demand, supply was outstripping demand, and you saw the, the requisite crash in the, the Henry Hub price. Well, then you get to a point in time where the Henry Hub price is now below, you know, the resource play. So nobody obviously is going to hedge it. So now everybody's gone naked and gone, you know, production, no hedging, right? And so what happened? Wall Street collapses, no money's available, so they, the people are rolling off the treadmill, they don't have the money to keep drilling, prices are collapsing, and all of a sudden what you see at that particular point in, in juncture is a massive stoppage in the number of drilling rigs drilling for shale gas. And the play started moving over by replicating the success they had in this particular area to start looking at liquid rich shale plays. And, and, and you know, whether or not we're gonna be able to time in history will only tell us whether or not the true success of the shale revolution in America was gas or whether it's gonna eventually be the liquid side that you know, relieves the United States from importing a huge amount of, of, of crude oil from, from other parts of the world. But we're, we're, that's where we are today. We, we, we kind of have moved away. We're not in a balance yet. We're, we're, we're a long way away from balance. And I've seen, I've seen uh, <coughs> a, a forecasts that had us out, you know, this oversupply for 20 years. 
when I started my career in 19, 1981, uh, in, directly into the oil and gas industry, uh, the, you know, the United States was coming out of a very big drilling boom in the late 70s. And it was almost driven by the same sort of policy decision made, makers as I see sometimes happening with, the, with the, what I see in the EU today in, in, in relation to uh, renewable energy, high subsidies. Well, in America in the, in the 70s, what, they, what, the, what, the, what the U.S. government provided, gas was a regulated market. So the U.S. government gave these incentives to oil and gas companies, if you drill deep, meaning 15,000 feet, 5,000 meters, or you drilled in these formations which were called tight sand, or you drilled in areas called coal, coal bed methane, you got tax credits, or you got a higher price. So naturally what the industry did, they started drilling a lot of these wells, all in these particular expensive areas, spent a lot of money, Ronald Reagan came by, you know, let the market be the market, and he liberalized everything, all, and what happened? Everything fell down to the common, lowest common denominator. And so, and that was the regulated price. So these incentivized prices were like $7, $8 per MMBTU, dropped down to about $1, $1.50. So in America, we ended up going for about 12 years in, the, in the, the, all through the 80s, et cetera, with this big gas bubble until supply demand basically balanced itself out again. And I think that's what you're, you're going to be facing again with this current situation. Now, what that means from an industrial side, you know, America can, you know, more or less see a, a huge renaissance in manufacturing again. I think this Asia cost, uh, cash cost advantage has gone away. I think you're going to see a reemergence of a lot of manufacturing activity back in the U.S. I think you're seeing that today where steel manufacturers are being, some of the base stuff has been done in the United States and being finished in, in Western Europe. And, and I think you'll start seeing the consumption more and more of gas, gas firepower generation, you know, gas being used in um, compressed gas for fleets, uh, uh, buses, trains, et cetera. So I think eventually it'll get it balanced out, but nobody knows really uh, how long it's going to take. But, but this clearly shows you that even today, there's only a few areas of the, the basins that are out there that are really truly economic relative to, to the Henry Hub price today. Now, just when we get into pricing, I just want to just make one distinction so that you understand. Henry Hub, or the NYMEX price, is a marker price. It's it just used as price discovery. You know, it is not a delivered price. So in order to get a price from, you know, from Texas to the Atlantic Basin or, or the New York City gate, you have to add the cost of transportation, et cetera. So, but it's a discovery price and people base their economics on the Henry Hub. And, and we'll talk a little bit about pricing before, but we did have this big problem, um, and, and I won't name a, a very big investment house, which, which shocked me, but it was a very big investment, it, and a U.S. investment house uh, at that, uh, was basically uh, talking about how great, you know, look, for the first time, the United States gas price is cheaper than Russia. And so, therefore, the Russian government should stop liberalizing price and, you know, it's over for the game. So companies like Novatech are going to have problems because we're not going to see these price rises anymore. Well, you're talking apples and oranges because the Russian price they were comparing for was actually a delivered price versus a market price. And when you added the, the delivery cost, U.S. was still probably twice the, the, the cost of an average Russian. We still see that today. But this is, this is a true problem right here when you're, when you're out there looking at some of the economics. Now, the other, the other problem that you see in, in the shill uh, play in the United States, which, which, is, which is problematic, is the flow rates, you know, the actual number of uh, units that, that come out of the well uh, relative to the capital cost. And, and, and what I show you on the, on the left side of the axis is basically the, the, the production numbers, and on the right side is the decline rate. And you can see that you know, conventional Gulf of Mexico shelf, you know, they're producing about nine million cubic feet per day, and have roughly about an 80 percent decline rate. Right? So you're investing a lot of money, drill starts declining rapidly, and you go through all these uh, pretty uh, similar, you know, either low pro low production, high high decline rates. Yeah. We, we have a well, we have a, we have a program at Novatech 
and it was called the Yaharskoy field. And just to show you, compare and contrast a little bit, you know, our average flow rates on our wells that we drilled in uh, the last couple of years when we moved away to what we call the big bore, you know, uh, big diameter wells, our average well produces about 150 to 170 MCF per day. The cost is about four times more than the average United States completed well, but it's producing, you know, 20, 30 times more uh, natural gas depending on what fails. So it's, it, it's, it's, the, the, we're, we're getting some of the largest flow rates in the world per well uh, in the whole industry. Now this is, a, this is one of the case studies. I, di I did a presentation at, at Oxford University on this uh, because they asked me to come in and talk about conventional versus unconventional shale. And, 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 and obviously, you know, it's almost like when you get requests. See, I, I was just getting tired. You know, in my role, I'm getting a lot of people, a lot of bankers want to come talk. You know, I got a great idea. I can guarantee we can get your stock price another 20%. You know, we got all these great opportunities. Just, just invest in a shield program in Poland. You know, don't worry about the economics. Of it. Just go on the market and tell them you're going to go to Polish shield, and I guarantee your, your share price is going to go up 20%. I mean, I, I couldn't kick them out of the office quick enough. <laughs> on almost, almost every one of them. And the reason why is, you know, this is a perfect slide that kind of shows you the difference in the economic values that we're, we're dealing with. When we, when we look at this particular uh, the slide, on the left side, it goes back and shows you a typical wells production and as well as the decline rates over time. You know? So, and then what you have to do to extrapolate that to, to do a field, and what we, what we did, we compared it to an average you know, production life of a Yaharskoy field, and we said that, okay, even though Yaharov is now producing about 38 billion cubic meters per year, when I did this, we were, we were just launching in the last two phases, we were only doing 30, so I said, you know, I'm not gonna burden them any higher to tell them to produce more, I'll give them a little, little I'll, I'll take eight BCM off and just, you know, to produce a, a 30 billion cubic meter field, how many wells do you have to drill if I'm um, doing a well in a Barnett shell? And, and I use the Barnett shell because that's the oldest. We have all the data in the world about this basin. You know, very unlikely we're going to get any surprises. People still love it. It's a, it's a great basin in America. Uh, but, you know, but there's a lot of history, production history, subsurface history, cost history to be able to do this. And so, you know, what you see is a typical decline on, 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 the, on, the, uh, on the wells. So to, to replicate a 30 billion cubic meters per annum field, you would have to drill 800 wells per, per year. That at about a $3 million per well completion cost. So if you did it 20 years, we calculated it'd be roughly about 20, almost 22,000 wells that you would need to, to drill at a cost of roughly about $65 billion. Right? That would replicate a, th that type of field. Well, I can tell you already, to reach 30 billion cubic meters at Yaharskoy Field, we drilled less than 50 wells at a capital, total capital cost of under $2 billion. And, and, and so, you know, you can see the economic differences. And this is one of the questions that were raised against the efficiencies and the, and the returns on invested capital. That's why Novatech today is the industry leader in return on invested capital, return on capital employed. You know, no matter any of those sort of metrics you look at, we lead the industry, global industry, in return almost twice the average of the industry. But this is this is very uh, this is a real this is a real numbers, and, and this is a real way engineers will uh, put together a program. And, and this is the cost, and, it, and it's, and it's you know, eye-opening uh, eye when you start looking at this and you say to yourself, how much revenue do I need to get to make this economic? Or conversely, I used to say to everybody, why do you keep asking me this question? Why the Russian government needs to continue liberalizing the gas price in Russia when, you know, I'm making perfectly acceptable returns and Russia, given its comparative advantage with large natural resources, doesn't have to have the same price as a country that's short on natural gas. So, you know, we're, we're, we're perfect happen. You know, the government's continuously on this program for the next couple of years, and they have been raising the price, so we're not going to argue with them against it. 
but it's but it's um, you know the program is to, to liberalize it. But but this shows you from an economic standpoint, as well as uh, as a real field, you know it's expensive to drill these wells because you have to keep drilling over time. So this is like the example that I showed under under Poland, and I said, well, there's 67 rigs, and you drilled you know 10 to 11 wells per per annum to reach, you know, you would get 2.2 BCF a day by 2020, which is 4.5% of the European consumption. It's not going to be a pan-European solution, and, and that was the point. It was like, you know, you have this hysteric reactions, you have this hope, et cetera, but at the end of the day, it may be acceptable and isolate and help some countries you know, with their import situation, but it's not a, a pan-European solution. So a little bit about Novatech. Um, when we went public, uh, we, we basically used this four-pillar approach, and we, and we basically said that, um, you know, we had great reserves. That was, that was evident. We had strong production growth. Um, we were considered, uh, you know, even at that time, pre-IPO, pre low-cost producer, and you know, the fourth pillar, we catch up saying the market, you know, the gas is so low in Russia, we really have no downside price risk. The only thing we do, we can go, go upwards. Um, I, I can tell you today, the same four pillars exist. You know, and, and I, we already had this done, and our bankers at the time were Morgan Stanley, UBS, and, and Credit Suisse. You know, I, I gave this to them, and they, no, we got to look at it. They had to do all their due diligence, and about three weeks, four weeks later, they came back and said, yeah, you're right. This, will, this should be the story. And it's the story today. We, you know, we're still a large resource. We're still a strong production group, low-cost producer, and they have been liberalizing prices uh, according to the Russian liberalization program. Now, in terms of Russia, you know, Russia is the largest producing country, uh, well, second now, because the United States bypassed it uh, two years ago, but is one of the largest producing countries in the world in terms of natural gas. It is the largest holder of resources. And Within Russia, the area which represents the, the sweet spot is the Yamal Nenets Autonomous Region. And more specifically, there's an area called the Nazdeen Portas region. And this is about 83% of, of, of Russia's gas. It, 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 it's, a, it's a holder of all the big gas farm fields. Uh, it's also the center of the unified gas supply system which is about 160,000 kilometers of pipeline transversing to Russia, throughout Russia, excuse me, and also that's the main trunk pipelines that get the gas into Western Europe. Um, we also see on this map, uh, we're starting to move a little further to the Arctic Circle. Um, we're moving into the Yamal Peninsula, and we'll eventually be moving into Gudan Peninsula, which is an unexplored basin. And that's what I was alluding to earlier, as the next big wave of activity, we'll be going further and further up north into the Arctic Circle. But that's just kind of a, a little map of, um, of really where the, where the uh, area of, and, our, and you can see where our, our LNG plant is, uh, is essentially being constructed. A little bit about our strategy. I mean, our strategy, um, you can see what our objectives are, increased resource base, production, maintain our cost structure, we look at maximizing risk-adjusted uh, margins, as well as looking at ways to optimize any of our market channels. So that, that's, that's basically the overriding strategic objectives. Uh, around that, we, you know, we also look at sustainable development, you know, prudent investments, uh, et cetera, uh, as sort of a, a more good corporate citizen. But what, we, what, we, what, we, what we're trying to do, though, is we're moving more to the Amal Peninsula and to Gudan. That's really going to be the heart of our next uh, levels of activity. We've also been very active in the last couple of years with acquisitions. Novatech has basically been acquiring companies in Russia as we start this process of consolidation of new gas assets, and we've been the recipient of very value creative acquisitions, uh, as well as participating in tenders. Uh, our plan is to double our gas production and triple our liquid production. We're going to expand our Perovsky. One of the things that is really unique about Novatech, and quite different than Gazprom, um, Gazprom uh, essentially what we call a dry gas producer for the most part. Um, what they do, they, they develop a layer called the Sandemanian layer. 
It's about 1,000 meters deep, 3,000, 4,000 uh, deep, but it's big formations. Easy to extract, dry gas. Um, Novatech, on, on conversely, what we do, we go down about four to 5,000 meters uh, deep in a layer called a Valanginian, and a Valanginian is a wet gas. So in 2004, we were sitting back and we knew that we were going to start investing a significant amount of capital, you know, significant for us, you know, into the development of your Harskoy field, and your Harskoy field is a wet gas field. And we looked around and we said, you know, do we want to be reliant on Gazprom to determine our course of, of our future activities? And the answer was no. And, and the reason why, because we were using a processing plant by Gazprom called the Serguski Refinery. And at that particular time, we had no really control over the cost structure. We had no control of the output. And anything that we received from a liquid standpoint from the, from the tailgate of the plant, it more or less went into Transneft, which was the oil pipeline of Russia. And Transneft, basically, if anything goes into, uh, into Transneft, you, what we essentially saw, we had high-valued liquids that were getting degraded down to a lower value Urals blend crude, and we were restricted to only export one-third of our product, and two-thirds had to be on the Russian domestic market. Now, you can imagine when you have all these big companies, the Yukoses with their refineries, Luke Oils and Gazproms and uh, TNK, and there's a small Novatec, and we're trying to go to the market and sell it our crude. Well, we were pretty much at the mercy of the buyer. And we said that we, you know, and, and I, I can tell you at times, you know, uh, Euros blend prices were trading, the market price was $26. They'd be offering us like $5 or $6 a barrel to buy the crude. And if we didn't take it, they said, well, you know, your problem. You have no place to put it. So we, we quickly went into this, um, to this mode of, of building this Perovsky processing plant. And by doing that, we were the first company in Russia to fully develop the value chain for, for the extraction of wet gas. So as we look in America and we see the story I mentioned before, how they're moving away from shale gas to shale liquids, monetizing the liquid side of the business and, and re-injecting in, in, of the gas, we were really the developers of that type of model in Russia, and we built our own value chain from the, from the processing plant. We used the Russian railroad for the logistics. We took it to a, a port. We built a port in Vitina on the White Sea, and now we export 100% of our uh, stable gas condensate. Now, just to, just to show you, in volume terms, I mentioned before, we, today we're producing about 1.4 million barrels of oil equivalent today. Uh, per day, excuse me. Out of that, 90% of the volume represents gas, 10% of that is liquids. But that 10%, given the fact that we can trade it on the world market price today, we're receiving anywhere from 35 to 40% of our revenue stream on that 10% of volumes, which is also equating almost to 50% of our EBITDA margin. So that small element of the business is extremely important, and it's been a driver of a huge value success for for Novatec. So we're, one of the things that to expand that, we're, we're, we're also looking to you know, expand that plant from 5 million tons to 11. We're building, uh, and we're actually in the process now of filling it up, uh, what's called the Novatec Usluga project, which is going to take it in, and refine the product even further. So we're moving away from being a raw producer, seller. We're actually going down and refining to NAPTA, jet fuel, diesels, getting down to a little bit more of the product stream and, and your mall LNG, which is transformational. Now, in terms of optimizing the channel, uh, again, one of the things, from a very, very small company, we've set some very big milestones. We were, the, we were the first company ever to transport hydrocarbons through the Northern Sea Route. That's the Arctic Ocean taking it through, you know, you know I, I would say, you know, you know that's, a, that's a direct result of global warming. You know, because it's one of those things where it was almost impossible to do, but now it's navigable, you know, five months, six months a year, and we're the first company ever to transport hydrocarbons. And it's, it's important, and I'll show you on, on a map, because what that does, that opens up opportunities, optionality for us to move product between Europe and, and, and the Asian Pacific market. But I'll show you in a slide, and I'll tell you some of the, the statistics when we look at that um, a little later. But this is our production profile. And, and one of the things, I, and, and, I, and I don't know, I assume at London Business School, everybody's business in various roles and you know, what your career aspirations are. 
Um, but one of the things that, you know, if you're sitting in, in my role as a CFO or, you know, you're in investor relations, et cetera, and you're talking to investors, um, everybody always wants to know, give me forecasts, give me guidance, give me, tell me what you're going to do. Um, what you find out is you live and die by that. And so you're very, very cautious of what you can report or not report because the market will penalize you for, for not achieving those particular results. And I'll ask the same question. I'll say, wait a minute, you keep asking for this. Can, do you guarantee to your investors what type of return? No, we can't do that, but they, but they ask us. And so, you know, this was very, very, you know, noble and, bro and bold of us to put out these types of, uh, of, of new, new numbers because it essentially said we're doubling our production. We have a, a history of, of achieving the results. So we had the, the, the first five years of operations. We showed what we did from 2005 to 2010. And now we're taking it to the end of the decade. So it's doubling the gas, tripling the liquids. Now, when we're talking about, I, I said before, Novatech already is the world's largest independent gas producer. When we reach the volumes of 113 billion, you know, it will be Gazprom number one in the world, and I wouldn't doubt Novatech will be number two. So, you know, Russia could essentially have the two largest producing <coughs> companies in the world in terms of natural gas. But how we're going to do this? We have new fields. All right. And I'll show you with those. Those are going to be either acquisitions we made over the last couple of years, and then eventually the big growth up is going to be into the Yamal Peninsula when we start the Gudan and Yamal project. On the other side, which is also very attractive for us, is the liquid elements. Is as we move more and more to this wet gas side, and 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 we go out and we start monetize. You can see we're going to get a very very large increase in the amount of liquids, which should be very value attractive to our investors as we start monetize those in the, in the future. What our role is, our, our role, um, you know, you're in, this, you're, in this, you're in this market environment where we're dealing with the 800 pound gorilla, you know, Gazprom and, and, and everybody else. And no matter how big we are, we're always gonna be a minnow in comparison to Gazprom. And, you know, it's nothing to be ashamed of because we, like I said, we've accomplished you know, many, many good things for a, a small, nimble company. Um, but it was clear in, in, in the strategy, Gazprom was, was losing market share on the Russian domestic market. It was still focusing on its European exports. It's invested approximately $200 billion over the last five years and has really failed to bring on any new, new productive capacity. So as the demand picture changed, Novatech has been opportunistic in gaining market share. So today, today we represent a little more than 8% of total Russian gas production. But when we exclude Gazprom out of the picture, Novatech represents about 50%, a little more than 50% of the non-Gazprom production in the, in the Russian uh, market space. And, and I think we have a, a very, very large uh, competitive first mover advantage on, on, on the oil majors are starting to migrate into the gas business. And we think by the end of the decade, we'll be about 14% of the, of the total market. Now, and just in some of the statistics, I, I you know, I, if the US market was closed, and I, I have to check it, it's probably not closed yet, this, this number changes tomorrow, okay? So the, the 9.4 number changes tomorrow. Um, we are, with tomorrow morning, we'll announce our 2012 reserves. And, and it's gonna, I can just, let me just tell you, it's the biggest year uh, we've had in terms of, the, since we've been in the oil and gas, it's the biggest replacement of reserves uh, that we had. So it's gonna be very, very positive news in the marketplace tomorrow in terms of uh, our, our reserves. You know, and I don't know, I didn't mention it before, but Total, uh, you know, owns uh, roughly about 15% of Novatech today. And, and just reading Total's full year results, uh, they clearly, the analysts picked up that Novatech was pretty much the driving force of any growth in, in, in Total's business at this point. Um, but you can see we have, uh, we have about 25 years of reserve life. We're larger than, uh, more than you know, double the size of some of the bigger companies. And I'm sure everybody's aware of BG. I, I spoke to BG and, and, and they were presenters today. And, and and I, and, I, and I told a woman who was there, Senior Vice President of Business Development, Global Business Development, you know, I told her, we, we really 
really as a company admire what they've accomplished and we wish as our own development we can do the same things that you have accomplished because they've had enormous challenges getting into LNG and have been very successful. But you can see in scale and size, you know, we're much larger than them uh, uh, on, on, on an asset base. When we talk about costs, it's the same thing. When I talk about the cost side, you know, when we look at, you know, BG again as an example, um, and we, when we look at this, we, what we call fine in development, that's the exploration development. That's the cost that gets capitalized to the balance sheet in terms of uh, what you do in any particular period of time. Y you can't look at it a single year. We generally look at these trends over three years. And Novatech has led the oil and gas industry globally, either one, three, four, and those types of numbers, for the last six three-year periods. So 2004, six, 2005, seven, 2006, eight, so forth and so on. This is 2009 to 2011. For us to find and develop our reserves, it's costing us an average of $1.50 per barrel of oil equivalent. BG is $14. You see Anadarko is almost $30. And so that gives us an enormous competitive advantage. I can tell you one thing, no matter what anybody criticizes, and we'll talk about Yamal LNG in a second, no matter what they say about it in the Arctic Circle, those who have the cheap resource base and have low cost can sell their product anywhere in the world. So we're, we're very proud of this distinction. And, 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 and this, is a, this, is a, this is an interesting um, number also, and I'm not saying that, one of the problems, that I can't even tell you, if you ask me what's Gazprom's number, I couldn't tell you because they don't report this number, you know, which, is, which is problematic because they don't, they don't report to some of the same statistics. Um, but when you look at it, you know, a lot of Russian companies are in this low, low number. Um, and, but, but, but it really attests to the, the fact that the, found, that the foundation of the company has been entrepreneurial. We bootstrapped our business from day one. I mean, we had no money, all the cash, 97% of the cash that we generated up until we went public was reinvested back into the business uh, and, until such time we started paying dividends out in, in 2005. In terms of the price, I said I, I would come back to this a little earlier, but this is an, an interesting slide because you can see in the, at the time of the crisis, we had sort of a, a significant drop off in the, in the price of, of natural gas on both the U.S., the Henry Hub, and the MPB price. Um, and, and what you see post the recovery, we had this sort of divergence in prices. And, and what this really tells us is that, you know, we have really different markets in terms of the price environments. And in, and in Russia, although we have this step-up approach, and we believe that the government will do it for the next couple of years, I don't mean that we're going to continue going straight up into the sort of hockey stick approach, because I don't think that's realistic. We'll come to an area where I think our price in a Russian domestic market will be about 125, maybe $150 per thousand cubic meters, roughly about four and a half dollars per MMBTU. Um, but you can see the United States is sub, sub four dollars. And, and the difference which makes it really problematic, and I think which affected negatively gas problems business, and I think which, which hurt the demand side, which also led to the cheap imports of natural or uh, coal for the United States, is that Europe is based on an oil price index model. And as I said, I would come back to this before, and when we talk about calorific parity bases, you know, generally speaking, we would say that six units of, of oil equals one unit of gas. So that's how you would price it. Industry has more or less been 10 to one, and that's been generally a standard. So at that price, would it just say that at $4 gas price, oil should be no more than $40 a barrel, right? So you can see the wide variance is that now we're not, we're at 25 times, 26, 30 times difference, right? And so you get in this huge divergence away from what the price is in America. That's why I'm saying to everybody is hoping that you can replicate the shale revolution in Europe because they see the dramatic impact on a pricing market. So the, the question that I think that's confronting the industry today is how sustainable this linkage is. And I think it's caused a lot of problems and it's caused a lot of concerns and issues with the EU regulators uh, on anti-monopoly issues, et cetera, against Gazprom. And I believe this is hurting them in terms of securing additional demand. Now, when we go to Asia, and I, if I push the Asian market slide up here and actually showed you Asian price, it's even higher. 
but but you know some of that was driven by the Fukushima accident, which you know got the prices up to almost twenty dollars, twenty one dollars them in BTU, but that's not sustainable. But unfortunately, a lot of the Australian projects that we see in the marketplace today are still dependent on those high prices. And I think that if we see a reversion back to a normal pricing environment, I think we can see some serious problems with the economics of some of those projects in Australia today. Um, the other thing that, you know, obviously when you're dealing in the oil and gas industry, and, and, I, and I would say probably a more recent trend uh, than, than has been historical, um, you know, we're operating in an area of a huge country risk. You know, and, 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 and areas that we thought were very stable or very, you know, easy business to understand, you know, have become areas of risk as BP in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, and environmental issues. Uh, and so we see what we try to do is here, because we get this question again as a Russian company, you know, uh, you know we're going to discount you as a company because you're in Russia and Russia has a high country risk. Well, Russia doesn't have a high country risk. It's, 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 it's a perception problem. Because if we look at risk, we have almost zero subsurface risk. All the risk that's attached to our business model is above the ground. It's the Ministry of Finance and making some capricious changes or announcements on tax policies and fighting it out in the press. You know, it's the demonstrations that happened in December of 2011 when the Duma got elected and people were concerned about rigging of the election. Well, surprising anybody who followed Novatech, we were the only company, and, 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 I'm, and I'm telling you, when I say only company, we were the only company singled out in many strategists and analysts report as a company with the highest political risk in Russia because one of our shareholders is allegedly a friend of Mr. Putin. And so they thought that there was potential risk with the demonstrations that, you know, his party would not, United Russia would not win, or there'd be changes in the parties, et cetera. Look at the North Sea. I mean, North Sea, everybody thinks it's stable. Well, we have changes in, in tax regimes. But areas where the industry is operating, we have a high risk. And you know, whether or not you go to Colombia with terrorism, Venezuela with nationalizations, you go to West Africa, Nigeria, and the problems that are going on in West Africa, you know, what happened in North Africa just recently in Algeria, Libya, um, Egypt, you know, Syria, Yemen, you know, East Africa, you got, you know, social unrest, et cetera. Cost inflation in, in Australia is off the board right now. And, and, and people presume that, that Russia as a country is, is a risk. Uh, but you got to measure these. I mean, it, again, if you're operating any business, looking out, you got to understand the risk in which you're, which you're operating. And, but there are a lot of risky areas today. And unfortunately, where we're going today, you know, where we're moving, where the industry is moving, is a lot higher risk than, than we had historically. Now, when we go north, I, I just talked about, I, I alluded to a comment before, as we go north on a polar circle, you know, what we see, you know, I, I said there was the five countries, and we talk about Canada, U.S., Denmark, uh, Norway, and Russia. Well, they're all fighting because you can, you can understand the, the, the magnitude of the resources up there. And, and so there's these questions about, you know, who owns what? You know, what area of, uh, do you follow the sea? Like when Russia, Russia is putting the titanium flag down on the, on, the, on the seabed, what they were trying to prove was that under the um, uh, United Nations law, uh, maritime law, that you have what's called this free economic zone that's 200 kilometers from your shore. But if you can demonstrate that that's an extension of your geographic area, that 200 miles doesn't apply. So Russia was trying to go underneath and put this flag down and saying, you know, all the way to the Lomotov Ridge is Russia, right? I, I have to say, it, it was, um, you, know, you know, when, when, when the, um, the Apollo first mission went to, to the moon in 68, I think it was 68 or 69, 69, um, you know, there's a lot of risk. And a lot of people, you know, applaud it, and you know that's a pretty amazing accomplishment. You know, you know, unfortunately, uh, Russia didn't get the same recognition. I mean, what these people did, you know, this expedition crew was equally amazing because they went, they went out and did this with absolute certainty they would never return. 
because what they did, they went in a submarine, they went into an open area, they went down the submarine, went out, basically pl planted the flag on the sea surface, and hoped when they went back up they would find an opening in, in the ice to be able to get out. And so it's kind of amazing, but they all went on the ship, and it's interesting when you read the stories about them, they all went with the understanding that they, they weren't going to survive. Um, but you have all that problems going on now with this, with this territorial disputes, and, and I, you even see that in um, the uh, East China Sea, et cetera, between Japan and, and, uh, and, and, and China. You know, one recognizes the 200 miles, the other, you know, the others. See, the problem you have with oil and gas, and, and, and even on the conventional areas, what you don't want, you have a block, like a square, and you don't want to go all the way to the end of the square and, and drill a horizontal well and start sucking the hydrocarbons out of your next door neighbors. Right? So somebody's going to look at it and say, wait a minute, so by doing that, it, it's basically going up to the end of the border, you're essentially trying to go into the Japanese territory and sucking all the, the hydrocarbons out of their zone. And, and America was smart. They, they, they unitized. They, they got a concept called unitization to solve that problem. But there was a lot of people who were doing that for many, many years by putting the, at the, you know, the, the, the border of their territory and using the, the gas from, or oil from the other properties. Um, this is a really transformational project for Novatech. And, and, and you know, it's a world-class LNG facility. It's going to be approximately 16 and a half million tons. It's going to cost us, in the order of magnitude, about $20 billion uh, to build. Um, we're, we are 80% owner, Total owns uh, a 20%. And, and, and it's, um, it's a challenging area because it's above the Arctic Circle. Now, it's not, it's not the first Arctic project. You know, Snowvik in, in Norway was an Arctic project. But this is very interesting because it's onshore. It's a very developed area. We're, we're using a South Tamboisque field. We're very, very fortunate that Sabeta, which you see in the middle, is the port facility. It's the new strategic port in the Russian government, and it's basically uh, going to be funded by the government, but it's right smack in the center of our area, and that's going to be the hub for uh, activity going forward. But this, is, this field over here, the South Tam Bay, ranked about number, uh, I think, 25, 26 in the, in the world's largest fields. We're going we're gonna to drill about 208 wells. We've kind of did some modifications. We've built the Arctic um, drilling rig. It's being assembled as we speak. Um, it'll go over, uh, by, 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 by changing the development program a little bit, we've been able to reduce and maximize, almost maximize the efficiency of drilling, reduce the number of drilling. It's, it costs us about $40 million per well, uh, per, per, excuse me, per drilling rig to build. So we were able to knock that down from eight to four and a number of pads. But the first production is gonna, uh, of drilling uh, commences in April 2013. Logistically, it's one of these areas where we're going to end up getting uh, a lot of, it's going to be like, uh, I, I try to explain to people, think of a, the big Lego project. You know, we're not going to do a lot of con you know, actual construction and fabrication on site. What we're going to end up doing, we're going to have all these things built outside and hauled in, and there's going to be approximately 300 modules, and they'll piece it together like a big Lego project. But we need various areas to come in, and this is sort of the logistical routes. They'll come in from Norway, they'll come in from Murmansk, they'll come in from ship, airports, come up the canal. But it's going to be a, a really a, basically a year-round operations. Um, now, it, it, I have a lot of slides on this stuff to talk about, but when you look at the temperature, the average temperature, the yearly average temperature here was like a minus 15 or something for the whole year, and it gets as bad as you know, minus 50, so you can understand it's going to be challenging from a, a human perspective, um, but, but not challenging from a, a technical. I think the engineering solutions have been already developed, and this is one of them. Um, if you look at the port facility, what we're, what we're having to do is, in order to really use this facility year-round, we have to have, uh, we're going to have icebreakers nuclear icebreakers that have to break the ice. And they're gonna, what they're going to do, they're going to break through the channel. So we're going to cut a path through the channel. Right? So in order to do that, the first thing we did, where the government is already working, they're about 40, 45 percent complete, they're dredging the channel. So there's 35 nautical miles at the mouth, five nautical miles at the, at the loading facilities. 
Like I said, they're about 40 to 45 percent done already. We're also taking the dredge in from that, and we're going to build a seawall. That's what, what it's, the seawall is, is intended to block moving ice. It's not going to stop it, but it's going to be really used to deflect the ice away. So as the ships are loading, the ice is not going to be banging up to the ships every time they're, they're, they're at, the, at the burden facility. So we come up with that kind of solution. But the government is, is basically building most of this complex. Uh, three birds, we'll use two of them, and we're, we're the beneficiary of, uh, of the uh, facility. The other interesting concept, uh, and then my colleague Constantine has been working on this and, and meeting with shipbuilders, but we also had a, you know, the question of what kind of LNG tanker we're going to be building. Right? And so what we've, we, we've developed uh, with Acre Arctic, we've actually created a new tanker, which is called the ARC-7 class tanker. Today we have an operation called ARC-4, but it can't really go into some of these really thick um, ice areas. So we've already had it. Discovery Channel actually did a movie on our vessel uh, as part of their uh, filming at Ar Arctic, um, Acre Arctic. And they actually showed how it worked. But what it is, it, it's essentially a, a, a you know, double hole. It has, it has crushers on it. And, and what, it, what it allows it to do, depending on the, the thickness of the ice, in open sea waters, it, it's, it's designed to be all year round in the Kara Sea. But in open waters, it can go as fast as 19 and a half nautical um, knots, which is standard. But in one and a half to two meter deep ice, it goes down as low as five and a half. So what you have to do, what you're, what you're trying to do is avoid, as you clear the channel, you don't want the ice to, to, to form again. So these vessels are going to be able to crack the ice as they're going through to keep the channel open. It's, it's a novel concept. It, it's, it's workable. We had a lot of questions on this. But the design is done. Now we're in a tender process. We're, we're, we're interviewing and tendering out to uh, uh, potential shipbuilders to, to build this. I think there's going to be, from along about 15, 16 tankers will probably be built. This is the market and arm, which, which, uh, and how we, how we view the market going forward. Um, what I said before is Novatech was the first company ever to go through the Northern Sea Route. And I said I would come back to that. What that did on a traditional route to move hydrocarbons to the Asian Pacific market before the Northern Sea Route, you had to go around Europe, through Gibraltar, through the Mediterranean, down through the Suez Canal. The last five years, you were being chased by Somali pirates, <laughs> and, and you hoped that you were faster than them, or you had some guns on the ship to blast them away as they came close. And then you came up through the Strait of Malacca, back up into the market. So you, you essentially passed you know, two, two choke points, as well as you know, potential for hijacking. And, and it took, on average, about 45 days to charter and deliver to China. Um, with the Northern Sea Route, which is open from May to November, what we do, we go through the Barents Sea, we go north to China, and we've now sent about 22 tankers through this route and we can hit the Chinese market in about 23 days. So it's almost half the time and half the distance to, to market by going through that route. Now, the flip side is we've also understood is that there's a lot of Chinese engineers working on the reverse side of this. Because what they want to do, they want to use this route during the same navigable period to bring commodities and goods to the European market. So it's been a very, very uh, a, a big um, uh, win for us in terms of logistics because I think that really woke up a lot of people in terms of the market. Because what that does now, for, for example, in terms of trading, we can now trade with swap cargoes on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a trading business with, say, the Qataris, where we both miss. We can send to Europe and they can, they can take some of our deliveries to Asia and we both miss this sort of, you know, Challenge in expensive routes. So this is this is a this is a pretty good win for us. Uh, we can go down to the Asian market. You can see we don't look at the U United States anymore as a viable market at this particular time. But that's changed dramatically for uh, where we are. But just to, to end a little bit, you know, one of the advantages that we have in this particular project that you're seeing is that we're able to de develop cheap, long life reserves. 
That's the biggest competitive advantage. If we look at the actual cost of the plant itself, they're going to be the same around the world. You know, we, yes, we have challenges in terms of climatic conditions. Yes, we're going to have challenges in terms of, you know, the, uh, the you know, construction and building <coughs> of this particular plant, the operations, the shipping. They're all going to be logistical challenges. But the, but the key advantage is the cost. Time to market, the efficiencies. You know, it, it, LNG, for those who don't understand or don't know the technology, LNG in a simple form is a refrigerator. You know, you put gas in, you refrigerate it, you put it on the ship, you carry it over to regas, they heat it up again, and, and you, you put it in a pipeline. So we always got this question, well, it's challenging in the Arctic Circle. I mean, how can you do this? Well, it, it, I, I asked the question, wait a minute. I'm, I'm a Qataris, it's plus 40 degrees, plus 45 degrees, and I'm putting a refrigerator in the desert. And yet you don't question that. What open happens is that we gain we gain about 20% operational efficiencies in compression and liquefaction due to the ambient temperature. That, in turn, reduces the average capital cost per, ca per capacity added. You know, so that's a, that's a uniquely competitive advantage and something that I think the market is starting to get its hand around in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, what the project is. But you know, we're now fully moving forward on this project. We haven't taken the final investment decision. We should be taken sometime this year. But you can see, if we looked at the time series, a lot of activities. They're building a seawall. The Arctic rig, as I mentioned, is being assembled as we speak. Housing, construction workers' housing, storehouses, warehouses, power plants, uh, airport facility, all being all built already. And we're ready to go in, 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 in the spring. I know that's been a lot of stuff, my friends, but that's it. <laughs>